There is no next without making the destination or expected outcome very clear. At Go Church, we are on the journey of our lives with focus, determination, and drive. And it is imperative that we clearly define the goal, salvation. To get there, we must help you understand who we are and what we are all about. We are building a Jesus community to serve the world. The question is, are you ready to go? Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are we all doing? Oh, praise God. Let's just give God praise this morning. Um, those, those, uh, those songs, those songs just get me every time. Yeah, they, 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 they get me every time. Um, I remember I just listened to, um, uh, I don't know if you know Mitch Albion. He's an, he's an author, he's a journalist and an, and an author. So I read, I read one of his books uh, called Tuesday Mornings with Maury. Maury, Maury, I don't know what it is, okay. Um, and, and he was giving a testimony about, and he happens to be a Christian, and he was giving this testimony about uh, his adopted daughter. He adopted a daughter from Haiti. And, um, and, you know, with the video and all of that, and this young girl was facing certain death. I mean, certain death. No cure. She had this incurable cancer. Young girl. And um, every day the song she wanted to sing was, is, um, no, not the goodness of God, the one before the goodness of God. I'm no longer a slave. It was on her bedside every day until she took her last breath. And she was so happy, young girl. She was very, very happy when she was dying because she was no longer a slave to fear. She is now a child of God. She was certain of where she was going. She knew uh, uh, that, you know, uh, death was not final for her. It was not a loss. And she sang that song, they played it. She sang that song with her mouth until she could no longer sing. And when she could no longer sing, they played the taste, played the music over and over and over until she took her last breath. Hallelujah. What am I saying? I'm just, I just want to encourage you that you're no longer a slave to, there, to fear. Um, for those of us here, we're not facing certain death. Am I correct? We're not facing certain death. So if somebody who is facing certain death could be, could be that, um, you know, that encouraged to know that she was no longer a slave to fear. How much more you that have an opportunity to live again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, this morning we just want to thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. Thank you, God, for your goodness is always after us. And we are no longer slaves to fear. We give you praise and we bless you. And is there anyone that's going through any challenge here this morning? We just thank you, God, because you give them the confidence that they are going to go through whatever the issue is. Yes. By you, we will lift over a troop. Yes. We will leap over a wall. Yes. In the name of Jesus, we will give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. How are you all doing again? How are you all doing again? All right. We are continuing with our series. And before I uh, overstay my welcome, it's ending next week. <laughs> so it's going to be ending next week. Uh, next week, uh, Sunday, we'll, there are so many things to say, but we cannot say everything, uh, you know, at one time. All right? So we'll continue. Um, we'll, we'll take a break, and then we'll go ahead some other time, find some other time to do it. And after that, after next week, we are going to have a kingdom conversation. Amen. And it's, yes. uh, amen. Yeah, amen. And that kingdom conversation is going to entail everything we have been doing since, you know, last year in terms of, you know, the change, the trans, 
uh, uh, what do you call now? The, the, the renaming, the change, the leadership, the everything we are going to, and the questions are going to be open. So just get ready, prepare your questions, any questions you need for the rebranding, for the change, for uh, whatever it is that you want, just get ready. Uh, in two weeks, we will be uh, doing uh, that. All right. Okay, so we're in number five now. Next week, we'll complete number six, and then we'll take a break for a while from then on. All right. So we have been talking about you know, uh, a Jesus community. And one of the things that we have said that I would like to reiterate every time is this, is that you have to know yourself, you have to know your purpose. If you know yourself and you know your purpose, it leads to what? Certain predictable actions. And certain predictable actions always lead to predictable outcomes. All right? If you sow, if you sow beans, or cassava, or maize, or whatever the thing is. Uh, if, if you sow oranges, don't be surprised that you, you know, that oranges are growing from your, you know, you're harvesting oranges, all right? So certain actions lead to predictable outcomes. And so we are looking at some of those things, and we are making uh, an allegory of all these, like a journey, that we are going on a journey here at Global uh, Outreach Church, Glow Church, we are making, uh, we're, we're on a journey. And on this trip, for us to be able to get to our destination, where we're going, for us to know we're on the right course, there are certain signposts that we have to pay attention to. All right, the very first signpost is what? What is the very first signpost? Everyone is welcome. That's the very first signpost. That's what you see. If you don't see that, if that's not the first thing you're seeing, know that you're on the wrong course. You're not on the right track. All right? Then the second one is what? Nobody is perfect. We're all growing. The third one is what? We uphold one another. All right? So we're on the fourth one now. The fourth signpost today is going to be what? Can anybody guess? Okay. All right. Nobody was, <laughs> nobody was in my room this morning, so I know that uh, this thing. Okay. The, the fourth one is going to be the fourth signpost. It's going to be generosity is a way of life. So the, very, the next signpost you are going to see, the fourth one you are going to see to make sure you're on track is generosity is what? It's a way of life. Generosity is a way of life. In every Jesus community, generosity is always a way of life. Can you open to uh, uh, Acts chapter 2 from verse 44? Open to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. Okay. Acts 2, verse 44. Are we all there? Acts 2. Uh, okay. Verse 44. It reads. One second. Okay. Acts 2, 44. Or am I the one getting it wrong? Acts 2, 44. Okay, so then, yeah, NLT, and all the believers met together in one place and did what? Yeah. Everything they had and shared everything they had. All right, go ahead, 45. And they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need, 46. They worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All right, let me put a caveat here. Don't go and sell everything and bring it to church. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, not what I, that's, not, that's not what we're, that's not what we're meant, meant to say here, all right? But this scripture is just telling us how generosity worked in the early church and how that we cannot move away from generosity as a Jesus community. Because what makes life really pleasant and what makes life go the way it should, one of the major things that makes life go the way it should is generosity. All right? Um, by nature, I, I like numbers. I really do. I, I, I like numbers. Numbers make my life really easy. All right? Uh, instead of reading 
the whole of this book. I just get some numbers and it just tells me what to do and what not to do. And here in this uh, church, uh, numbers are really important to us. Every Tuesday, 12 p.m., like clockwork, we pour through numbers. We pour through all kinds of numbers, financial numbers, uh, loan numbers, um, attendance numbers. We pour through numbers, and it helps us in a lot of decisions that we make and, uh, and all of that. And I said that to say this, that at the beginning of this year, I, I went through some numbers and I did some, you know, work in my head, you know, put it on paper and did it on my head. And that is just try to see what state are we as a church in uh, our generosity thermometer. How generous are we as a church? And I did, you know, a scientific, something that's not very, sci not scientific, I'm sorry, not scientific. Just the calculation, just the basic calculation that helped us uh, out. And uh, I want you to know uh, that in the United States of America, the average Christian gives about $884 a year, all right? That's the, that's the generosity barometer of the average Christian in, uh, in the United States, all right? Now, that means everybody that goes to church and everybody that says they give. So if you take the average, if you take the total number by how much comes in, you, you, you divide it by the average, it ends up being $884, all right? Um, I did ours here, took, you know, what we gave last year, divided it by the number of people that gave, and then added some numbers because, you know, sometimes in our midst we have people who are not able, but they are willing, but they are not able to give. So to just make it a little bit fair, I added those numbers to it and, and I came up with something very surprising. In this church, on the average, we are giving twice more than the national average. Yeah, it is as a clap. In this church, it means that on the average in this church, we have a bunch of generous people. I said that to say this, that I said that to say that, you know, uh, is this, this message is supposed to be an encouragement for those of us who are already generous to be, to be much more generous. And this also is to be a challenge for those who are not part of the generosity van or train to join this train Amen. and just be generous. I may not be able to promise you, you know, heaven and earth and all of that. I'm, I'm not going to do that, right? But I'll just tell you there's benefit yeah. in being generous. Yeah. There's benefit in being generous. So many of us on the average are doing very well. In other words, we don't need too much uh, to fit into the Jesus community completely because we are already on the generosity train. All right? But there are some of us that just need a little bit more, you know, to just join this train and be much more generous. Now, Man, this time just, look at what we say, that generosity is a way of life. When somebody tells you something is a way of life, it's not just ordinary. When something is a way of life, there are three components to it, to something that is a way of life. When you say, oh, something is my way of life, this is my way of life. Right? There are three components to it. You know what? There must be habit. There must be, then habit moves to what? Culture or tradition. And culture and tradition moves to belief. So if somebody says, hey, this is my way of life, check if, if that is a habit. If it has moved to culture and then there's a belief in it. Let me, let me, let me tell you what habits are. Habits, number one, uh, are actions uh, or practices that happen over a period of time. In fact, in, 20, in 2009, there was a study in the European Journal of Social Psychology that says it takes about 66 days of consistent practice for habits to form. 
You do something consistently for 66 days, then you begin to form a habit. However, habits, if they don't move from habits into culture, they're easy to break. So what am I saying? What's, what's culture? Um, culture, customs, traditions, you know, they are habits of a group of people or individual that have been practiced over a long time. Though the norms are unwritten, even though it's a norm, it's something that you do consistently over a long time, it's unwritten, all right? And so you have done it over and over and over, and it becomes, you know, you go past the 66 days, and you do it over and over and over, and it becomes a what? It becomes a custom. It becomes a norm. Like the Bible talks about Jesus. He said, as his custom was. He went to the temple. In other words, Jesus did not just decide, oh, let me go to the temple today. Or he did not just decide two, three days ago and say, let me go to the temple. No, it was his custom. It was his tradition. It became tradition. Traditions and habits are so strong that they are difficult to break. They impede on certain things in our lives sometimes. And that's why Jesus Christ also told us, uh, he told, the, uh, he told the, um, the, the Pharisees now, he says, the word of, he said, you make the word of God of none effect because of your tradition. When we say something is a habit or a tradition, it does affect everything in your life and it moves and becomes the basis for which you do something. Now, habits in themselves are not alone, are not good enough, all right? They have to become beliefs. Beliefs are things that you have come to accept, irrespective of what they are. You have accepted them as truth, God-given truth, whether they are true or not. You believe them, you agree with them, you embrace them. And so they are so firm in your life that you cannot live without them. It's like something is gone in your life. How does that go with gener uh, generosity? We are saying that generosity has to become a habit. From a habit, it becomes a custom or a tradition. From a custom to a tradition, it becomes a belief that you cannot live without. That is how the guys in the book of Acts, that was how they lived. It was so firm. It was so real to them. In the book of, um, uh, uh, hold on, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1. If you read, if you go there, I will open to that, but just go home and read it and all of that. Paul was talking about the, the, the Macedonian church. And he was talking about how generous they were. And guess what? Their generosity was not pre predicated on the abundance of what they had. They did not have money. That's what about, if you, I mean, read it. From verse 1, 2 Corinthians 8, starting from verse 1. They were not rich. But Paul said that these guys gave so much even beyond what they were able to give. Why? Because generosity is not a thing of how much money you have. It's first of all a thing of the heart. If what you have does not leave your heart, you cannot leave your hand. And it's a habit. Why? Because it's something you have to practice over time. You have to practice over time. Generosity does not just come naturally, unfortunately. Because as human beings, or as, or as, uh, or as humans, we are traditionally or naturally, our natural default is to be self-preservative, right? We, 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 we want to preserve ourselves. That's, what, that's our natural, I mean, until you begin to deliberately decide to break this habit or decide to create this habit of generosity, it's never going to happen. You will always fall on your natural default. And that's why I am talking that when we talk about generosity as a way of life, it has to start from a habit, it becomes a culture. And then from a culture, it becomes something that you believe so much that you cannot live without. In the history of church, church history, we were told, or we read, or we know, or, or you know, you get the information of how that when the church came, the church actually started like a sect, right? It was, it was, it was a sect, 
it was people that you know people did not you know care about the people who really have you know what they, in fact the word christian when they call them christians it was derogatory it was not it was not a name that was given to people to you know uh, because they like them or because because the name no it was derogatory what they really call them is the people of the way right people of the way it started like a sect it started like i said before it became a movement but what made Christianity a movement, one of the major things that made Christianity a movement was the spirit of generosity that was present in the people that practiced it. Because women, like I told you before, were property. No value. But Christianity came and gave them value. He said, in Christ Jesus, neither male nor female avails anything but Christ." Unless you are a male child, you had no value. In those days, I'm talking about 2,000 years ago, you had no value. But Christianity came and gave value to people. In those days, the world was divided into the nobles and the lay people. If you had money, you are good. If you are poor, too bad. But Christianity came and gave value to people who are poor. How did they give value? They did not just, the, Christian, the Christians in those days did not just uh, 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 go to people and, and, uh, and just say, okay, oh, tough luck, oh, goodness, oh, no. They actually went and demonstrated the love of God through the giving. They made sure they met everyone's need, everyone that was in need. They make sure they met it. You know why Paul, uh, 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 you know why Paul was writing to um, uh, the, uh, the, the Corinthians? When he was telling them from Acts, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 8, why he was talking? He was telling them, he was talking, he was, he was trying to encourage the Corinthian church to help the church in Jerusalem out. And he was using the example of the Macedonian church to explain to them how it is beneficial to give. You know why? Because the Jerusalem, the people at Jerusalem that time were facing a lot of issues. Things were going on in Jerusalem at that time. If you're a Christian in Jerusalem at that time, you were marked for death. And so you could not do so many things. You were an outcast. Nobody wanted to deal with you. Nobody wanted to do anything with you because you look like a sect. You sounded like an idiot if you called Christ in those days. These days, we, you know, we, we, enjoy, we enjoy Christianity, especially in this part of the world where we enjoy Christianity, we do whatever we can do, but it wasn't so in those days. And because of that, because of that, folks couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't get lands to farm. They couldn't go to places, nobody will have mercy on them. So if you are poor and you are all of that, then, you know, it's bad luck. It's just hard luck. And so Paul was telling the Corinthian church that, hey, you guys, things are going good for you. You need to remember your brothers in Jerusalem because that is what we do as a community of people that have come to accept Jesus Christ. Sir, excuse me. That is what we do. We look out for one another. We help one another. We give a helping hand to one another so that everybody can at least have something. And so Paul was telling them, you have no excuse. There's no excuse for not being generous because the Macedonian church, and the Macedonian church is a group of churches, not just one church. It comprises the church at Colossians, when you see the letter of the Colossians, it comprises uh, the uh, Thessalonians, the, Thess the churches at Thessaloniki, and, you know, and, 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 and some other churches that way. All right? So there were a bunch of churches, or a group of churches, who were really poor, but they were ready to do something for the Corinthians in their own time of need. And so why am I saying all these things? I'm saying all of this to let you know that we have no excuse not to be generous. It is not how much you give. It is your heart 
and what you have to give. Paul said, make up your mind what to give. Nobody's going to force you to say, oh, give this in. And thank God here, we don't even talk about, you know, percentages and all of that. We just tell you to give. However, we want you to be generous in the way you do it. Why is that important? Why is that important? Um, uh, uh, sometimes when I listen to, you know, uh, uh, messages on, 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 on giving and all of that, uh, the, the only area of concentration, the only area of focus is that area where you talk, oh, you know, if you give 10,000, you get 20,000. If you give that, you get, you know, you get all of this. And, you know, forget about all those things. Uh, Paul said it very clearly that that is even supposed to be the least in the area when it comes to generosity. How did I know? Because Paul said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But they're always teaching it in the reverse. It is greater to receive than to give. But the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, am I saying that God is not going to bless you? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying the main reason for us being generous, sometimes it's not why we are doing all of that. All right? And... So what are some of the reasons why? Number one, we have talked about a Jesus community, right? We talked about a Jesus community, that we're in a Jesus community, and, uh, and, and this thing, there are certain actions, there are certain things that we must do as a Jesus community to be able to get to this thing. So number one, a Jesus community is a worshiping community, all right? It just comes to the worship community. We worship our king. And one of the ways that we can express how our worship goes is by what we give to God or what, how we help ourselves. That's why Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do that to me. If you help somebody, guess what? You are doing it to Jesus, and that's an act of worship. Look at what Paul said. Paul said it very well in Philippians 4, 18, that this gift that you have brought to me will be a sweet swelling aroma to God. So, it's an evidence you're giving. It's an evidence of worship. In other words, there's a spiritual connotation or there's a spiritual dimension to your acts of generosity. A Jesus community is a loving community. Am I correct? One of the ways that you can actually and practically show the evidence that you love is how generous you are to every other person. You can go and read that from Luke 10, 5 to 35. You know, Jesus talked about, you know, something concerning uh, uh, your act of, you know, love from the story of, um, the, the story of uh, the Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan showed active love, unconditional love, by what he did, the act of generosity he showed to the guy. The guy did not look like him in any way. The guy did not uh, have anything in commonality. In fact, based on what the world dictated at that time, they were supposed to be enemies. But the guy went and showed an act of love to this thing. Now, the third one is, the third reason why generosity is important is that a Jesus community is a serving community. Am I correct? And one of the ways we can show that we're serving is through our generous services or generous giving to everybody. And look, sometimes I don't want to say this and all of that. I just want you to be generous. Now, let me say this. I want you to bring whatever you have and help us because we have things that we can do. But if you don't trust me, if you don't trust us here, you don't trust us, the leadership, just be generous anyhow. Be generous anyhow. So what am I saying? I'm not saying this because we want to benefit. So Paul, said, Paul said, look, I'm not telling you to be generous because it's going to add something to my own account. No, that's not the reason. It's for your own credit. It's for you. So what I'm saying, I'm saying it and, and I mean it. Now, I'm not saying don't bring whatever you have. That's not, don't go and say that, that's what I said. That's not what I said, all right? But I'm saying for the few of us that don't trust us, how we can do it, that we're going to use your money judiciously, right? What you're supposed to bring? Take it somewhere else. Be generous to people. 
God wants you to be generous. And that is what I'm telling you this morning. God wants you to be generous. He wants us to be generous. Generosity does something to God and it does something to your soul. It does something to God. And it does something to your soul. Uh, last year, sometimes last year, uh, there was this guy that came here and, um, and the guy was telling me uh, how things went bad for him. He just came to service and he brought another guy and he was introducing the guy to me and said, hey, this guy, you know, this, is my, this guy is my friend. He's falling on you know, very hard times or very uh, tough times and I brought him here because when I fell on a very tough time, I came here and Lom actually did help me to get back on my feet. And he talked about how things were very hard for him and, and at some point his wife even died. And, that's, and so things were hard financially. His wife died and he just kind of gave up and could not do much. But one place he had the confidence that if he went he was going to get something to eat was at Lom. You know Lom? That's our food pantry right down, you know, right down, right down in this building on the other side, on the other section. He said, I know if I came here every week, I was sure that I was going to take something home to eat. And that helped me so much that now I'm on my feet. And I can bring somebody again because I know I was helped here. And so sometimes that's why I said, you know, what you give, your generosity has spiritual dimensions. It, had, it has impact beyond what you can think. So when he came, when he told us that, you know, when he told me that, my heart was so lifted. I was, I was just full of joy. That I'm a part of something that helps somebody to get back on his feet. Is he here today? No. Is he a member of this church? No. But I know there is an impact of Jesus that he felt. That's right. That's right. That will never be taken away from him. You can say anything about this church that guy would defend this church to the end because when he was down, guess what? This was where he found hope. This was where he found hope. I want to tell you, I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning that for this Jesus community to be able to move on and do the things that God has called us to do, and be able to do it well, we will need a lot of your cooperation. And part of your cooperation will be the act of generosity that you are going to be a part of. All right? What about, can I, how, how much can I say about uh, WARM, the, the mission agency of our church, or of the whole ministry? Do you know that there are some, there are some missionaries that are out there that they don't, I mean, they will not be able to at least meet a good number of their daily needs without the support that they get from this place. Amen. Monthly, monthly, we support people, missionaries. We support courses. Monthly. And the support that we give is unconditional because like I told you, remember I told you that it's not, it's not how much you have, right? If it does not leave your heart, you cannot leave your hand, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's not the, the, the support that we give is not contingent on, oh, whether we had a good offering. Or we had, it's a commitment that we have made. And those commitments will fulfill them. You know why? Because that is what a Jesus community looks like. We help other people. Generosity is a sense of taking care of other people. It's that place where you get to where other people are as important as you are. You feel the sense that you guys are together. Let me just quickly give you one thing, one reason why, one reason why, uh, 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 we, one reason why we have money from a biblical standpoint of view, one reason why you know, money is important, why we should make money 
all right? One reason why we should make money. Many of us, many of us come and we want to make money so that we can make more money. But primarily, that's not what, that's not what the scripture says primarily. You get, you get what I'm saying? Paul was talking, uh, Paul was talking in the book of Ephesians. He was talking to certain guys. Ephesians 4, he was talking to certain guys. And he was telling them, you guys were no Christians. When you were not Christians, you were thieves. Those guys were thieves, right? They stole. That was how they made their living. But Paul tells them, Paul told them, he said, now that you are now Christians, now that you are Christians, he said what? He said, let him that what? Stole, steal no more. To be able to do what? To be able to use their hand to get something so that they can be able to give. Paul is saying that the primary reason for money is generosity. What am I saying this morning? I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not, I don't want to badge anybody. I don't want to, you know, everybody to his own. But I'm just saying this morning that you can join this train of generosity. Let's start this train, this habit, this culture, this, um, this, 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 um, you know, movement of generosity. We want to overwhelm our community and our world with generosity as much as God enables us. That is one of our goals. There are so many things to do. There are so many things that we want to do. But look at what Paul says. Let me just quickly run through certain things that Paul said. All right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 tells us that generosity is a spiritual thing. It makes us know that, that generosity is a spiritual thing. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 helps us uh, to know that it comes from the heart. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 4 uh, helps us to know that it's a privilege. We should see it as a privilege whenever the opportunity to give comes. And then uh, Paul tells us, which is where I'm going to end up now. Uh, not quite, but really. I'm go just going to end up now in a few seconds. Uh, Paul said we should make up our minds. Nobody should force you to give, right? Nobody should make you give anywhere where they're, I'm twisting you, you know, give and all those kind of things and all of that. You know, that's not a godly thing. That's not how it works. God will rather win you than force you. Yeah. All right? God wants to win you. God wants to enlighten you. God wants you to know. If God wants to force you, everybody will be born again today. <laughs> right? But he's not forcing everybody to be born again. That's not the God way. That's not how things work when it comes to God. God wants you to understand what you are doing. He wants everything to be done out of a sense of understanding. All right? So he said, don't let anybody. Paul said, don't let anybody force you. Don't let them tell you, but you make up your mind That's right. what you are going to give. However, there's a caveat there that he who gives sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who gives generously will reap generously. All right? But the, thing is, the most important thing is that make up your mind as to what you are going to give. What does make up your mind mean? Plan. Plan how to give. Plan how to use your money. And within that plan, make sure that there is an act of generosity there. Generosity should take priority. It should be prominent. It should be, it should be at the top of the ladder. When you're planning, plan to give. Plan what to give. Plan what to save. Very easy. Plan what to give. Plan what to save. And plan what to spend. Because if you don't plan, you probably are not going to do it. Because what Paul, what I understand by Paul saying, now this is my own interpretation. I'm not saying this is Paul's interpretation, but this is just my own interpretation. This is what I understood from what he's saying. Paul is saying, when he says plan, he is saying that it is better to be consistent because you want to create a habit than just, you know, give one day and say, oh, there's a need today, just give $10,000. Then you don't give again until there's another need 10 years' time. All right? That's, but be consistent. Be consistent. Plan to give to the poor, not just the church alone. Plan to give to the poor. Look for a poor person around and help them out. Plan to give, not just your family, because the gift that we give alone sometimes is just to our family. Look for people who are in need that can feel the love of Jesus tangibly. They will appreciate your giving much more than all these things that we're doing. Look for people that you can give to that don't have the opportunity to pay you back, to repay you in the same coin. That is where the blessing is. 
And finally, if you're here and, you know, you have challenges, you have, you know, you have challenges, financial challenges, you are, you know, a little bit down here and all that, we have our generosity post, which we call the benevolence, you know, benevolence, you know, funds. We're not going to give you cash, all right? But we are going to pay your bills. If it's bills, you need to pay your light bill. You're back on your light. Not credit card now. We don't do credit card. <laughs> don't, don't go and blow your credit card and then bring the bill here and say, pay. <laughs> no, that's not what we do. All right? What we, what we do is if you have your light bill, you have some kind of challenge, and then you are coming short in all those things. Talk to my wife. Talk to... Sister Shadi Kembi, talk to Brother Dio. They are the ones managing that post. There are some funds there, not a lot, but there are some funds there. We, 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 we put money there to just help people. All right? If you have this kind of challenge, this is a Jesus community. Yeah. We need to bring everybody to power. Yes, sir. And make everybody feel that they can meet their needs so that you are not being drowned by needs. Mm -hmm. If you have, if there's anybody like that, or you know anybody here that is going through those challenges, let them talk to us. We'll be able to do something. Because that is what a Jesus community does. Are we all together? God bless you.